Tal vez, hoy, como veis, no falta sitio. El, tenemos hoy en el instituto a Brecht Arnaert, que es belga, belga flamenco, y nos va a hacer un, uh, un nos va a dar una charla sobre lo que él llama el ciclo, el ciclo económico intelectual, ¿no? El intellectual business cycle lo tenéis ahí puesto en inglés. La charla va a ser en inglés. Eh, Brecht habla algo de español, pero no el suficiente como para dar una charla. Está de hecho aquí en Madrid, de la Universidad de Rey Juan Carlos, y él tiene una teoría eh, que ha elaborado. El, bueno, él es lector y, y conoce muy bien la obra de Gramsci, de Antonio Gramsci, sobre la influencia de la ideología sobre la cultura, o mejor dicho, de la cultura sobre la ideología, y ha elaborado una teoría paralela eh, basándose en los postulados de la escuela austriaca, ¿no? que os va a exponer hoy, lo va a acompañar de una lo va a acompañar de una pase de diapositivas para el que no sepa mucho inglés. ¿no? Eh, gracias por la introducción eh, y gracias para, por invitarme eh, a dar una charla. Eh, es un honor para mí de estar aquí, pero voy a seguir, seguir en inglés porque mi, mi español no es tan bueno, no tengo todo el vocabulario para exprimir mis, mis ideas y para por la gente en, que sigue en el internet eh, es interesante de oír en inglés. Entonces vamos a, a empezar. Um, I want to give you the structure of uh, this presentation and it's actually quite simple. <laughs> First we are going to look at some history, then we are going to look to some theory, then again some history and then it goes on and on and on. And for people who have uh, some knowledge about Austrian economics, might see a reference into to a, an important work by Mises, namely theory and history. The way we see uh, history is determined by the theory we hold. And actually, um, a quote I, I heard is that history is just an illustration of the theory you want to see. Um, and because um, any research project is always uh, in phases, you have a personal interest in something, then you see some things, then you try to, uh, to to theory there is already available, and then you go back into the field and observe again. So it's uh, a cycle of uh, theorizing and then applying, theorizing, applying. And what I have tried to do in this uh, presentation is to show you how I uh, arrived at what I think is, is an application of uh, the Austrian business cycle theory in the realm of ideas, and because we think that only uh, material products have to be produced. Uh, it's my uh, thesis that uh, concepts uh, are also up for production. And we will see how this uh, works. So let me start with some personal theory because of history. Because um, um, if you if, um, work with ideas, you always have phases, you know. In my uh, earliest days, I was very into objectivism. I think Pablo can testify that um, I gave a lecture uh, two years ago, I guess, here about uh, objectivist epistemology, and I was totally immersed in, in what Ayn Rand said about ideas. Um, and, well, this was my, these were my tenets at, at the time uh, on the metaphysical level is reality exists independent of our consciousness. Uh, on the epistemological uh, level, it was reason, reason, reason. You can reason everything out. Uh, the ethics was man needs an objective code of values because if you don't have uh, a moral code, then you, you'll get lost. Politics was to defend uh, the rights that, that, that you need to, to be able to build your own moral code. Government must be installed, but a minimal government. And then, of course, in economics, capitalism is the only moral economical system. This was one of the, the great tenets of, uh, of, of objectivism. But then I came to Madrid. <laughs> and I studied with, uh, with Huerta. And, uh, well, if you look at the five fields, uh, then you have uh, a totally different view. And the hardest thing was the last field, again, economics that values are not objective, values are subjective. Values, valuations depend on the individual. Um, this uh, bottle does not have the same value to anybody in this room because our hierarchical 
uh, value systems are all different. We have a different background. We have a different history. We are all different. That's the only thing that we have in common. Um, so coming here to me was like a, a cold shower. It was like, you know, I, I, I invested so much also psychologically in uh, these are the seven virtues you have to follow. Uh, um, you know, um, the non-aggression principle, I tried to, to, to think that this was the trader principle Ayn Rand had found. I tried to save my paradigm, but it got, it got crushed in a year's time, <laughs> so I had to rethink everything. And that made me realize that, you know, the ideas that we hold are often, you know, they come from somewhere. You conceptualize reality, and then there's a new reality, and your, your idea has to change as well. So investing time in ideas, trying to understand them, and then seeing a change in ideas, that, that, that put me on the road to, you know, maybe uh, ideas have to, be, have to be thought out. So, so the confusion was, was very big. Huh? I said, no, uh, values are objective. And then somebody said, well, how do you measure them? Do you have, a, like, you have centimeters for length? Uh, do you have the util to measure value? You don't have that. The only thing you have is valuations, t which you can put on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a common scale. OK, so um, what I'm trying to do is to apply Austrian economics in the realm of ideas. And for some people, they don't need any introduction in Austrian economics. But just a quick overview, of course, it, start, it all starts with in 1871, uh, principles of economics, uh, which has one metaphysical statement, which is the first uh, line in the book. I don't know if anybody knows it. All things in the universe are subject to the law of cause and effect, which is, which is, a, which is a great start for a book, I guess. Then you have uh, Von Bawerk. He's a bit underrated, I, I, I find. He smashed, he really smashed Karl Marx in Karl Marx and the close of his system. And in 1920, you have Mises who finishes the job and he says uh, uh, in socialism, you know, the only, the information needed for central planning can only be generated in a free market. So that, that is the beautiful paradox that Mises ha has put in mind. But uh, in Prices and Production in 1931, that's where I find my, my inspiration for what I'm going to tell now. And it's about, it's about uh, the structure of production. Um, I don't know how, how much I have to tell about this. There, there are a lot of economists in the room. But uh, the economy, as we know, does not exist. We are all individuals exchanging value. And uh, if we consume things, um, there have been several layers of production. If I buy a sandwich in a sandwich shop, um, the oven in which the sandwiches are um, uh, heated uh, or baked has to, had to be produced too. Uh, in the factory where the ovens are produced, uh, aluminium and iron is needed, which is produced in a mine. And so you have a, a, a structure of production. And um, when the thing is, when, when government interferes with this uh, free production, uh, namely by injecting uh, fiat money into the economy, what you get is a distortion of the structure. Um, you, you, are, you have a certain amount of money, uh, and you add money, then the purchasing power per unit drops, which means that interest rates will artificially drop. Normally, interest rates are determined by uh, how many um, how much people are saving. There are a lot of savings in the, in the economy. The interest rate will be low because there's a, a large amount of capital uh, available. If nobody would save, if, if, like, if tomorrow doomsday comes, then nobody saves and everybody spends, then the price to borrow something would be very high. And preferences have, have dropped. Um, and um, I was... Um, I was back to history then, so this, this is uh, a little more history. So in 2012, I, I went to a seminar at FEE uh, in Irvington, New York. And uh, there was one boring lecture. I won't tell you which one it was. Uh, There's only one, because I, it was a very interesting uh, seminar. But you know, sometimes it happens when you have ideas and you have too much time or you're, you're bored, you start drawing things. And I started drawing the structure of production by height. I know it's 
say that, but uh, I thought, well, I was thinking about, about politicians and intellectuals and, you know, we, we go like the 25th of May, we have new elections, and then we as individuals will go and vote for a political party. And this political party will legitimize itself with ideas that come from intellectuals. So I saw I saw some some levels of, of conceptual uh, abstractions. Huh? The, the lowest abstraction in for individuals is just taking a decision. That's the lowest abstraction. But if you don't know, um, but to take decisions, you need standards. You need to be able to weigh alternatives to a standard. But you don't have time in your whole life to think standards. So uh, if I say computer problems to you, the first person that pops up in your mind is an authority for you in the field of computer problems. And that's the person you will be visiting when you have a computer problem. So you don't think out all the standards of quality or all the standards to make decisions. You, you go and buy ideas. And when you don't agree with an idea, you often say, I don't buy it. This this is one just one uh, little remark. So I started wondering: Could there be a market for ideas? Could there be maybe an intellectual structure of production? Um, and then I started reading. I was reading. I was still reading Rand, um, the Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, which is about how we make abstractions. We see a, um, a, a chair, we see a table, and we abstract the essence. And then we have a new concept above that, a higher level concept, which is called furniture. And we can abstract furniture together with cars and houses and come to an even higher abstraction, uh, which could be object. And if you make abstraction of all objects and all subjects, you could abstract it to the highest level, which is just being. Stuff exists. So I was, I was philosophizing about this. And at the same time, I was reading Human Action about time preference, about the fact that when people get a cash flow, some people like to spend their cash right away. So they have a very high time preference. They want to consume stuff now. And uh, other people, they say, well, no, uh, we can save or invest, and we will reap the fruits later. So we don't have to uh, consume everything now. We can consume later. So this is a low time preference. <laughs> And this, this was all mingling in my head, you know, um, concepts, higher level, lower level, time preference. I saw our culture, which, which is instant gratification. We, we cannot wait anymore. We, we have a very short temper uh, in our culture. So this was just mingling in my head. I thought, well, what if concepts have to be produced? What if there is a hidden structure of production we don't see? Well, if that is right, I should be able to all the economic concepts to intellectual concepts. I should be able to talk about buying concepts, borrowing concepts. And I think I have, uh, I, I think I, 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 will, I will show you all how I made all those translations. I, I translated 30 concepts from the economic realm to the intellectual realm, the equivalence of that. OK, so I got a little bit further in thinking th there might be something in it here. But then again, then you have this guy, Stefan Kinsella, and he says, well, ideas are, are not scarce. So if I want to do economic analysis in the intellectual realm, and ideas are not, not scarce, how can you do economic analysis on a non-scarce good? If I, if I explain my theory tonight, and you all copy it, then I have not lost my theory. <laughs> you have just copied it. So, so um, this was a, a, a big question for me. And I thought, well, maybe it's just an analogy. That, I won't be able to, to make the case hard. Um, and I, I, kept, I kept reading, and I thought, well, maybe uh, ideas are not scarce, but um, the time you need to conceptualize an idea, time is a scarce good. We only live in a certain amount of time, and, and we can only focus a certain amount of time. I started doing some uh, psychology. Uh, Jenlin has written about this, and a Hungarian psychologist with a name I cannot pronounce. But they speak about focus time. During the day, you have only a limited amount of time you can, you can focus. There are, for instance, students who say, well, I've studied eight hours today. No, 
they've been at their desks for eight hours, but that's something totally different. They have been daydreaming or, or fantasizing, but really conscious focus, eliminating contradictions, thinking. Um, in their researches, they, they talked about three and a half to four hours a day, which is not that much. So now I had a, I had a scarce good I could study. We have to economize on our time when we think. And what is the, the only thing you can do? Well, this is one, one last thing I, I, I found while, 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 while mingling. I also saw that um, concepts uh, get duplicated. There's the famous lecture by Zaya Berlin, Two Concepts of Liberty with, with the positive and the negative freedoms. Maybe you know it. Uh, the, the freedoms are the, the liberties that um, enable uh, the, the, the individual to uh, come to fruition, to, to flourish, and the negative, I don't like it that he calls this negative, uh, are property rights. You know, property rights is, is not that important in their view. Uh, so I thought, two concepts of liberty, how is this possible? If you identify reality, you have to have one clear concept. So one of those two concepts must be wrong. I, I studied the work of Alan, Alan Kors, who said that um, uh, Marxists have never taken any credit or, or responsibility for uh, all that happened in communism. Whenever um, somebody says, well, this idea led to that practice, no, but that's not real communism. Well, Mao, no, that's, that Mao was not real communism. Or, 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 or Stalin, Stalin was not real communism. And so you, you have all these kinds of versions of concept of communism, and nobody's home. <laughs> Nobody said, whoa, I, I, this was Marxism, but not real communism. So these are the observations that we make. And uh, I, I read Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, his book, Democracy, the God That Failed, in which he clearly shows how, uh, by using democracy, you can inject new, new rights. You know, There's not only property right, but there's right to free education, right to uh, free health care, right to this, right to that. Nowadays, I, I wouldn't be wondered if, if there would be a right to a nice haircut or something, you know? The, the, this has devalued. This, this, the, devalued. So these were all, all observations I tried to put into the theory. So the question I, I started uh, thinking about, what if we can inject fiat meanings into existing concepts? You know, uh, fiat means, it's Latin for I, I agree, I trust. I trust that this is money because the government says it's money. Uh, what if meanings can be injected into concepts and we trust that the meaning is identifying reality but actually it's something different? If I can prove this, then maybe I can show that conceptual inflation exists. And if that is true, I can show that the structure of production, the intellectual structure of production distorts. And is that, if that is true, I have a conceptual framework to analyze history. So the history of ideas as a, boom, as a series of boom busts using this theory. So it's quite an ambitious <laughs> project. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I will present it to you now. But the problem is always definitions, of course, because I can talk a lot here. Definitions, definitions. My kingdom for a definition, I, I would say. I have to define everything, consuming, investing, buying, borrowing, risk, interest, credit, money, inflation, distortion of the structure of production, uh, entrepreneurship, prices and markets. In, in the realm of ideas, how, how I, am I going to do that? And then, then comes the friend phase. That's what I call the friend phase in research. You have an idea. You're not quite sure if it's, if it's worth anything, so you check it with the people you trust. Don't, do not make a fool of yourself. And this, this took like a year and a half or something. Uh, we had great debates in, in, with Huerta, but also on the internet, uh, to, to define the, the, the different uh, intellectual um, layers. Because uh, as I said, you have um, a number of, uh, of phases. Um, so anyway, this was introduction, but it's very important that you uh, get a grip on how the process evolved, uh, because you will see that uh, mm, that the theory, the culture theory I will present is also a personal theory about 
how your own thinking evolves through time by making higher abstractions and by lowering your time preference. This is, if I have to uh, summarize everything I have been researching in the last couple of years, I, I can do it in this uh, picture. We start at the bottom by just looking at individuals. What do individuals do? They value ends. That's everything you can say about them. They, they have a personal plan in their life. They value uh, the plan within a means ends framework. And on the, on the road, these ends can change, but that's how it goes. But they value ends. As I have explained, um, to value something, you need a standard to, to weigh alternatives. You cannot think out all the standards in your life, or else you would be a philosopher. We don't have the time to, to think out all the standards. So we go through authorities. And by authorities, I don't mean people who have power. This is a big difference between authority and power. Power you take without principles. You cannot have principles when you want power. And authority you earn by showing consistency in principles, by showing integrity, by showing um, you know, uh, intellectual courage when needed. But these authorities, they are just people like you and me. They, they made errors. They, they have still a lot of questions they cannot answer. Question is, if they can tell us what to do, where did they get their information from? Well, and the answer is quite simple. They picked it up from the intellectual atmosphere. Uh, so the level above that is the level of the intellectuals. And what do intellectuals do? Um, intellectuals are not very original people. They read scientific theories and philosophical theories at best or they invent their own theories at worst. But in any case, they, they appear everywhere. They're, they're on television, on the radio, in the, in, the, in the newspapers. They are the distributors of ideas. Um, but of course, they have to find their, their inspiration somewhere too. And I've already mentioned them. The level above that is the level of scientists. And scientists are people, real scientists are people who are not that interested in, in going public with their, with their work. They just want to focus on uh, connecting observations with axioms. And that, that, to me, that's the definition of science, connecting observations that cannot be explained yet by means of logic to axioms, to, to valid starting points of thinking. So they are actually the producers of, of, of theories. We have a theory about the world. There's something we cannot explain. We make hypotheses about how it could be logically connected. Then we do an experiment, at least in the natural sciences, uh, to, to create new theories. Theories will, which will be spread by, by these intellectuals. But these starting points that scientists use to connect their observations, they're not interested in, in if this starting point is valid. A good, a, good, a good scientist is. He's also a kind of philosopher. If you look at uh, Isaac Newton, for instance, he was not only a physicist, he was really a metaphysicist as well. He, he thought about the nature of reality. So the top level is the philosophers. And that's what I call the miners of ideas. They really get the, the, the first ore out of the ground. So this is the intellectual structure of production I, I have tried to come across. And you know, this is just a drawing. This is not dynamic. This is a static image of um, some levels of, levels of abstraction. To, to make it dynamic, you really have to show how this structure of production can, dis can be distorted. And uh, the answer is, uh, if you have what I call false authorities, people who do not have the integrity to lead, but who want the posture and want the reputation of, 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 a, of a true authority, for instance, politicians, uh, you know, they, they want to get followers. And how do you do that? Well, you have to come up with a good story. You have to say, for instance, I will defend the, right, the rights of the weak. What I want is, is justice, but I want a special kind of justice. I want social justice. So what you need is, an, is, is, is a story that can legitimize your power. And that is my definition of ideology, a narrative that can legitimize power. And who, who thinks out these narratives? Well, this is, this is the intellectuals. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Julien Benda. He wrote a book, uh, Le Trahison des Clairs, 
is, is in French, and he talks about the treason of the intellectuals. When intellectuals start legitimizing power, then your society is lost because you know the the one uh, political party will have his intellectuals and the other will will have as well. So you know you're you're down a slippery slope of of politization of your of your polis. Um, this means that um, the that the relative price of um, concepts will change. And now I want to take you uh, to the translations of concepts. I've said you can buy a concept. How do I define buying a concept? This is pretty gratuitous when I cannot define it. This is my definition. Buying a concept is integrating it without contradiction in what you already know. Borrowing a concept is using a concept without really understanding its meaning. If I buy a concept, I spend focus time. I'm trying to get my head around it. If I um, talk about skipping here, maybe some people know the meaning of the word, but others won't. So they will start asking questions. What do you mean by skipping? Is it different from this or that or that? One meaning of skipping I did not know is that when um, the, the, the shops close and there is a lot of uh, products who have uh, passed the, the, the date uh, of uh, consumability, they throw them away. But uh, there are people who go uh, and uh, look in, in, in the garbage for, for products which are just one day passed, but they're still good. That's called skipping as well. I did not know that. So I had to spend focus time to, to acquire the concept. I have, but now I have uh, integrated it without contradiction in my existing conceptual framework. So the next time I will hear this concept, I will not have to spend focus time. I, I can just say, well, I'll, it's already added to my, to my conceptual capital, my intellectual capital. Um, um, but if I do not have enough uh, intellectual capital, uh, or, or, or I'm lazy, uh, then I, I just borrow concepts. If I would ask you to take a paper now and write down the definition of the concept mindfulness, I'm pretty sure we will have, you know, like 20 different definitions. Because everybody is mindful nowadays, you know? Well, it's important to be mindful. OK, well, I, I agree, but I don't really know what you mean by mindful. Well, it's a kind of, and then you get a description. You don't get a, what's this? Can somebody uh, just can check? Just ignore, say, accept, and I don't know if I can. Uh, um, <laughs> OK, so where was I? I maybe I have. Well, let, let's just go through the definitions. That's the easiest thing. The only thing you can do in economics, you have two choices. Either you consume or you invest. So if you have your cash flow of uh, uh, focus time, you, you consume it. And what do I define as consuming? Spending your focus time on lower level abstractions. For instance, gaming, chatting, um, watching television. <coughs> you don't invest it. You, you just use your, your, your time you have but you don't learn anything. So investing your focus time is spending time on acquiring higher level abstractions. And why would you do that? Why would you spend time uh, acquiring higher level abstractions? And the answer is because it lowers your cost in the future. For instance, in ethical dilemmas or, or in dilemmas you have in your relationships, if you don't have a, 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 um, acquired higher level abstractions like justice, for instance, you will end up in situations which are very uh, bad for you, um, and you will have to pay the cost of changing your behavior then. So if you can prevent um, um, behavior that does not suit your, your essence, who you are, um, then, um, well, it, it's a good thing to, to invest in acquiring higher level abstractions. Um, buying and borrowing, I already said it, integrating a concept into one's existing base of knowledge without contradiction. And borrowing is just using it without integrating. Just you use it. What is the danger of doing that? The, the danger is um, that you act because man is a conceptual being. Animals are perceptual beings. They, they just uh, act upon a perception. In, in lower cultures, uh, they act upon perceptions as well. If you have a high, highly cultivated culture, they uh, act on conceptions, on, on, on abstractions of reality. They don't think about the here and the now, but they think ahead. 
and the time preference is lower. Actually, civilization is nothing more than lowering time preference. So um, a prophet is spending less time in the future to make uh, decisions. Like in business, if you have 10 years experience in HR, you will uh, have a very profitable decision making. Um, if you haven't got the ex experience, uh, you, will, you will need to uh, correct your behavior later. Credit and risk, I should be able to, to, uh, to translate it as well. Well, uh, credit in the material stru structure of production um, has to be with the, the borrower, uh, the one that is receiving the money. If, if I want to uh, um, lend out $1,000 to, to Dante, he needs to have credit, you know? Uh, can I trust him? Does he have a reputation of, of, of paying back? In the intellectual realm, it's the other way around. If he comes and asks for my advice, he is actually the borrower of the concept. Uh, I need to have an, a certain authority in, in, in the thing I'm, I'm talking about. So the, it's the exact reverse. Um, and risk, this is the possibility that a borrowed concept is not a correct identification of reality. And I will go even further. Uh, I, I will make the claim that there is an intellectual interest rate because in a society where a lot of cognitive capital is working, where a lot of people think, where a lot of people buy their concepts, not borrow them, they check them themselves, what is the risk of a faulty concept hovering around? It's very low, because if you have a popular concept in, in, in the intellectual economy, which is wrong, and everybody's thinking, then pretty fast everybody will say, well, this is, this is, this is bullshit, this is not a good concept. Uh, if you have low, uh, if you have, uh, well, not a lot of cognitive capital at work, when everybody just goes with the flow and they don't think, I would say this, this is the culture today, they don't think for themselves, you know, the risk of, um, of borrowing a wrong concept is enormous. So you, you can uh, be mindful all you want, but uh, if, you, if you end up in a situation where you really need to know is this the good way to go or not, if your concepts are very vague or even wrong, then you will end up in situations you really want, don't want to end up in. So the intellectual interest rate determines the price of present concepts in terms of future costs when the concept is wrong. I know this is a lot to take in, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's three years' work I'm presenting today, so maybe we can, we can, we can chat about it later. So th there is also credit risk interest rate. Now, well, we also have higher order capital goods in intellectual goods. What is the, the highest order capital good in intellectual goods? That's logic. Logic produces all other lower level concepts. If, if, if my logic is faulty, then I will have a bad production. It's like when the philosophers um, start with bad axioms, you could compare it with uh, gold, dug out, gold um, ore dug out of the ground with a low, low, very low grade. Then, uh, or iron with a very low grade, then your iron that you produce will not be of that of as good quality. So if you have vague uh, dogmas, uh, like uh, uh, we should all be equal, for instance, which is, to me, is a dogma, not an axiom, uh, you will end up with uh, political philosophies that lower down the intellectual structure of production, which are uh, not identifying reality anymore. Uh, and the lowest, uh, lower order consumer good is a decision. Uh, and a decision I define as, as an automatic response of our subconscious as a consequence of elim elim eliminating contradiction. When as long as, as, as a problem, I always say a problem exists in its definition. Once you have defined the problem, you have solved it. And that's, that's when decisions come. Okay, this would lead us too far. But, you know, there is buying and borrowing, profit and loss, credit and risk, higher order capital goods, lower order consumer goods. Let's look now what, what happens when you get central conceptual planning. These authorities, false authorities, what, what do they want? They want people to follow them. Um, you know, a true individual listens to everybody but follows none. He, 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 you know, he, he takes all per, um, perspectives and then he creates his own path. Uh, in our collectivist culture, we try to conform as much as we can to other people. Why? Because you know our whole um, education system 
is built on producing the ideal fiscal slaves. That's, that's my view, you know. Uh, get a house, get a job, get a big, big, big mortgage so that you cannot, you, you could escape the, the slave plantation, but you know, uh, you have to indebt people, but you also have to morally indebt them. You have to make sure that they um, feel obliged to follow the authorities, that they fear uh, what is outside the plantation. And Stefan Molyneux ha has, has a great concept about this. He says, he talks about slave on slave violence. If, if, I, if I would say, hey, there's a hole in the fence which, through which we can escape, the other fiscal slaves would just bash your head in because they, they're afraid to, to, for the responsibility that comes with freedom. So what, what, you, what you want is a system that um, actually kills creativity, that just, you know, follow, follow the guidelines we, we put, put out for you. Um, but they cannot do this without this distorting the structure of production. Because if, if, if we go back and um, they inject fiat meanings in existing concepts, then um, you will have a, a cheap decision-making process now. People don't have to pay, take responsibility, but in a few years' time, they will feel cognitive dissonance because it's not who they are. They, they want to be creative and want to walk their own path, but they feel the conformist pressure rising. And that's why you have so many neuroticism, depressions, whatever. People want to do their own thing, but they're trapped in a system. Um, this makes the lower bar of individuals shrink. I define an individual as somebody who makes his own choices, also known as somebody who buys his concepts. But if you're psychologically dependent upon the system, you don't have the cognitive capital anymore to, to, to buy your own concepts. How, if I would say that um, taxes are theft, if I would dare to claim that, I need a, a lot of courage to do that. If I would be a trained economist uh, working in a bank, if I would say that uh, fractional reserve banking is immoral, I need a lot of you know, courage. And, you know, you, you have been discouraged to be yourself from a, a, a lower age. So the investment you have to make to, 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 to fight the paradigm is enormous. And that's why I like libertarians. They have a fighting spirit. Um, so um, you have conceptual inflation. For instance, the concept justice. Um, well, it, ha has had, it has had different meanings uh, over time, but you could define it as getting what you deserve. If you have done something right, you deserve moral credit, and your status will go up. If, if you have done something wrong, you will suffer from uh, social exclusion, and when you have uh, repented enough, you can join the group again. That was the original meaning of justice. Now, what happens when we inject fiat meanings into that? I have made a list of 32 meanings of justice uh, with all kinds of adjectives, social justice, climate justice, sexual justice, intergenerational justice, you know, you go on, 32 meanings. So when, when somebody says, I favor justice, justice needs to be done, what is the buying power of the concept? Nothing. Everybody wants justice until you start talking about definitions. Same thing with freedom. Uh, I need uh, our, our rights. I, I, I gave the example earlier. To me, the most fundamental right is property right, uh, the right to freedom of expression, is only a derivative of property rights because um, nobody can, if, if you respect property rights, then nobody can hinder me from expressing my views with my own uh, television station or my own newspaper. It does not mean that the government has to provide you with the means to express your feelings because now everybody has a right to free expression. Or the, the concepts have been perverted, have been inflated. But as we know, inflation is not the real problem. Inflation is, well, it's a symptom. The real problem is the distortion of, of the structure of production. So this bar becomes very short, and you get an inflation in the higher order capital goods. You get a, a boom of philosophies. Like, take for instance, HR philosophies. Expensive theories, cheap decisions. Uh, a, a crisis manager comes in, and he takes a, an, an HR philosophy with him, like Six Sigma or uh, evidence-based evidence leadership or, you know, all these kinds of theories. And what do you see? In half a year's time, 
seven, eight months, it doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore because it's not based on, on an identification of how things on the workplace go. It's just a prefab theory about things. Um, so what you actually get is the structure of production getting top heavy. Like even the cleaning lady has a personal philosophy. You know? and, and this is, this is a, a, a very long bar. The bar of individuals is coming shorter because individuals are people who take their own decisions. They don't exist anymore or, or not many. And, and the whole thing crashes. And that's the intellectual bust. First you had a boom, and now we have a bust. Um, another concept, debt, debt uh, in intellectual terms is a tribute you have to pay to the party that informed your decision. If your uh, uh, stockbroker said, well, this, was a, this is a good stock to buy, and he made that, that you earned money, then actually you owe him some recognition for that. Um, if the politician um, who you voted for has um, um, made sure that the social benefits you normally get have heightened by 10%, then you owe him something. You think you owe him something, but he, do, he did it with stolen money, but you don't know that at, at that time. Um, and taxes, intellectual taxes, this is the denial to, to keep the right, to keep the products of your intellectual labor. How many times have I talked to students who have a really original idea for a thesis, and then even far in the process, the professor says, well, no, it's not really an illustration of my theory, so no. Now, this is, this is what I call, you know, taxes. You, you tax uh, the, the, the student, he has to show fidelity to the system, he cannot have his own ideas. And, and as long as you walk the line, uh, you're going to get a job and you're going to get what you want, but you have to walk the line, please. That's, that's, that's what I call taxes. Uh, so th the word crisis comes from, from Greek and it means the moment where illusion dissociates itself from reality. And what people are starting to find out, that in, in the next coming years there will be so little money for consumerism <coughs> that a lot of the cognitive dissonance that you can sedate with that will come out in the open. People will, will be confronted. Now, nowadays people define themselves by what they consume. And they will have to be, they will be obliged to define themselves by what they produce. You know, if, if, if you look at uh, Henry Hazard, uh, Economics in One Lesson, he, he wrote this book while uh, doing two or three jobs. And you know, people define themselves in, in what they produce. Nowadays if you have an iPhone, that's, that's your, your main identification as a person. And everybody has an iPhone nowadays, so <laughs> you need something different. You see? So uh, you, you will see that the ratio between offer and demand of concepts uh, will change a lot. Now, this was the theory. If my theory is valid, I should be able to apply it to history. Um, there should be, uh, in the history of intellectual, in, in the intellectual history, there should be uh, boom, intellectual booms and busts. Now, to, to, to present this tonight, uh, we would have to talk for four or five hours to, to make you know, some approximation of, of an interpretation, so I will not do that. I will show you one example of concept, conceptual inflation, and this is uh, what uh, the Frankfurter Schule did. Um, there are many more um, examples, um, but, um, well, I have, to, I have to stay within my time. We can discuss it later. I have identified three intellectual busts and three intellectual booms in uh, Western uh, intellectual history, but it's too much to, 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 to show you here. Let, let us start with the, with the Frankfurters. This man, Antonio Gramsci, I, maybe you know him, was an Italian, German-Italian uh, Leninist. Um, and uh, the thing was, Marxist theory always said if the if it's the proletariat, the, 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 the workers, realize that their class consciousness is false, then they will join up internationally and get rid of the bourgeoisie. That was the idea. That was pre-World War I. What did we see in, in World War I? Uh, proletarians of, of all nations took knives in each other's belly. They were loyal to their local national bourgeoisie. So... <laughs> Uh, Marxist class theory was in a deep crisis after World War I. And 
you know, it needed some innovation. And this guy, um, Gramsci, did it. He said, well, it's not only that the political sub superstructure determines the economic uh, substructure, the problem is actually culture. Be because as long as this proletarian thinks he's a German or thinks he's a, he's a French guy, then we will not have an international uh, bond of revolutionaries. So the real enemy actually is the bourgeois culture itself. And um, he, the thing is, Mussolini saw the danger of, uh, of these Marxists and he put him in, into jail. But the problem with putting Marxists in jail is that they have a lot of time to think. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he wrote the, the Caderne del Carcere, and that is the, the thing on, on which the Frankfurter Schule based their culture theory. And uh, they, they were really in Frankfurt, and this is the building. This was the, the Karl Marx Schule. And again, uh, Hitler uh, saw that he had competition on the left, because to me, Hitler was a socialist. I always say uh, uh, there's only one thing worse than national socialism, and it's international socialism. But <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just the same thing. Um, what did these guys do? They said, well, how are, what is the bourgeois culture to start with? That is the culture that, ex that respects individual rights. Ayn Rand has said that civilization is the process where man is set free from men, which means that right, she interprets rights as a moral concept, as the thing that is, stands between you and the mass. If we would have a democratic vote here on who will pay all the canyas tonight, you could all vote that it has to be me. It would be a democratic decision. What stands between me and you? my individual property right. You have no right on my money. Punto. <laughs> <laughs> so what these, these guys had to do, they had to make individual rights suspicious. But how do you do that? How do you um, attack an, a sociological institution that has been uh, cultivated f for centuries? How do you do that? Well, you, you start injecting new meanings. You hollow it out. So what they developed was a, a theory called the critical theory. What is very intelligent is that it is neither a theory nor is it critical. Take the Federal Reserve, for instance. Federal Reserve is not federal. It's a private institution with a public uh, charter, and it has no reserves. But why did they call it that way? Because you can deceive the whole public. They think it's an official institution. No, it's a private institution. It has been uh, created in 1913 on Jekyll Island, as we all know. Uh, so if you want to have a, a theory uh, combating the, the paradigm, you call it the critical theory. Now, to be critical means to make a um, difference between, between, two, between wrong and right. And theory means that you have a fixed set of um, of, uh, how do you say that, um, pro propositions. This is, I, I, I really spend a lot of time trying to define what the critical theory is. And the answer is, there is no such thing as the critical theory, but they kept on bragging about the critical theory. So what did they do? They wrote books, like for instance, I think the book is by uh, Marcuse or Adorno, I don't know, The Authoritarian Personality. And the official explanation was, well, we have to understand how Hitler could come to power. But the, the book actually was used uh, to critique um, the, the institution of, of uh, the family. The father was the author authoritarian guy in the, in, in the room, and the children has, had to uh, fight against his authority. They, they tried to, uh, mm, to put it that way. The, the one last thing I have to uh, say about the Frankfurter Schule, so Hitler expels them from, from Germany, but at the same time, they have been recuperated by the American political system. Because imagine, if Hitler expunges uh, 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 scientists, Hitler must be against science. So if we take in these scientists in, in America, then we are the good guys. So what you get is first-class intellectual Marxists who get all the, the means they need to disperse their ideas in America. In the most capitalist country in the world, you take in a whole bunch of Marxists and you give them means to, to, to disperse their ideas. So in 20 years' time, you get conceptual inflation as well. 
with the sad um, high point w was the, the Berkeley revolt, where, where there was contestation. Why? Because of the contestation. There, there was not, it was critical theory. It's just, you know, we are against stuff. So you, you, you get confusion. And then the reaction of the system is, well, what, what, what is it about? Maybe we should listen. And, and then the, 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 the uh, liberty-minded people are starting to combat each other. That was, that was the original intent. And an even more insidious um, cultural tactic has been used by the Fabians. The Fabian Society, you, called, you could call them the English Frankfurters. They are an, at the London School of Economics, which is not a school about economics. It's a school about politics. Huh? So um, what is their tactic? Fa uh, they have not stolen their name. Uh, the Fabian Society is inspired by um, Fabius, which was a Roman um, uh, general. And he attacked Hannibal using, Hannibal was stronger than him. And he knew if I confront Hannibal directly, I will lose. So what do I have to do? I have to make small incisions in the flanks. Never confront them up front. That's why you never have an honest debate with people from the left. They say they want to debate, but they don't. They just want to do a hit and run attack. Like for instance, prophets are immoral, and then they're gone. So if you ask, why are they immoral? Define immoral. What's your base, uh, your moral ethic code? They're not home. But the, the venom has been put into the debate, and they're gone. A marvelous um, movie about this is Wag the Dog. Normally the, the expression is wag the tail, wag the dog, which is about propagandic um, means of, of changing reality. Uh, this is about a man who wants to get elected in America du during the period of MacArthur, uh, the, the hunt for, for communists. And he says, I have a list with 103 people Within the, department, within the Department of Defense with a communist, with a part, with a card of the Communist Party. And he gets a lot of attention in the, in the press. And then he gives a, gives a press conference. This list with 240 people on it uh, the, who have a, a, a party membership of the Communist Party, I will publish it next week. And then another press conference comes. And he says, this list with 374 people why, why did he do that? If you have watched Mad Men with Donald Raper, he says, if you don't like the subject, change the conversation. Journalists are no longer interested whether or not it is true that there are communists in the Department of Defense. They start debating about how many there are. So what you get is a false debate. How many communists are there? You have accepted the premise that there are communists, and that's not even proven. So that is how people are led astray by um, by these kinds of things. And I will show you later what we as libertarians have to do. For instance, never ever debate about conclusions. Because, because conclusions just come from the premises they, they have posited. You always have to question premises. So this is, this is what I call intellectual terrorism. They just, they just say something and then they're gone. And they never really uh, have the honor to stay in the debate and attack you for your premises. They don't do that. They know you're strong enough. So you have false debates today. So how high is the ideal tax rate? Well, I'm, I'm for a, flax, uh, a flat tax as long as it is zero. <laughs> uh, should minors be able to vote? Well, voting to me is uh, choosing who will steal from you in the next four years. Uh, there should be a law. Nowadays, nobody says, well, maybe I have a business idea that could solve this problem. No, no. Everybody says, there should be a law preventing this or that or that. So your, your whole framework is changing. Even within the libertarian community, you have a witch hunt. You are not a true libertarian. Well, I am. Look. Da, 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 da. So we are, we are totally confused in our conceptual approach to things. So uh, it's my uh, idea that the Frankfurters, the Fabians, cultural Marxism has won. They have one. But now we have to look what, what can we do. So if you know that, that, the, uh, that ideas, that, that concepts have to be produced, then what, what you actually have to do is to show intellectual entrepreneurship. There is a market for ideas. There is a market for people who feel a lot of cognitive dissonance and, and want to be free. But they just don't see how. 
they think that being free is buying a new car that will require less uh, maintenance. You know, the, 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 the time preference has, has heightened so much that they can only think about economics, maybe a little bit about politics, but ethics, oh, don't think about ethics. Or epistemology, the word only, the, what is that? <laughs> is that a kind of, of animal? Or, you know? <laughs> so what we have to show is intellectual entrepreneurship. Always check your premises. If somebody tries to debate with you, don't 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 jump on to, to his conclusions. Ask, but what is your starting point? Where does this come from? Why do you say this? And very often you will see that they don't don't have a starting point. They're just brabbling. They borrowed ideas. They did not buy them. Kill your dogmas. There are a lot of dogmas, even in the libertarian community. For instance, um, if I would. Uh, like the, the, the ethical subjects like uh, prostitution and suicide and stuff like that, if you think things through, uh, respecting the non-aggression principle, these things are not a problem at all. But you do feel that there's a so kind of moral tinge about it that is not right. Uh, but then I see the base between libertarians uh, arguing about uh, the f a free market for prostitution. Uh, maybe, maybe we should check if we don't have dogmas because that would be humble to do so. Recognize framing. Recognize when you will be put into a position in which you cannot give a right answer. This is, this is, these are questions I call, do you still beat your wife questions? If somebody asks you, do you still beat your wife? If you say yes, well, you immediately admit you're, you're an asshole. <laughs> but if you say no, you imply that you have beaten her in the past. That is framing. Recognize framing. Be very conscious. Eliminate contradiction. For instance, I have a right in free education. Okay, this person has a right, a property right. So actually, what you are saying is that there are right, that there is a right to um, to infringe upon rights. I, I, I pay the one right with the infringement upon the right of another. This is a contradiction. Eliminate contradiction, and then you will see that you have a logical flow of rights coming from the the uh, right. The property right. So we have a, an incredible opportunity nowadays because the, this is not only an economic crisis, this is also uh, a political crisis, an intellectual crisis, a cultural crisis, and a spiritual crisis, the five levels. So we have an enormous uh, market open for us to, to come with a new paradigm. It's incredible. People are, are, are waiting for us. So what, what can we do? Um, my my biggest frustration is that we, we have the theory, we know the solutions, but we don't get it across. We're very cerebral. We, we always discuss. But if you look at Marxists, what do they do? They always play on emotions. Will you leave this poor person behind? You have a moral duty to do so. It's always, you know, uh, on, on emotions they work. Why couldn't we do that? My first um, realization that freedom is not only uh, desirable, but, but possible, was a, a, a truly aesthetic moment for me, knowing that it is possible to have a free society. Because otherwise, if we just would be philosophizing, armchair philosophy, that does not give you an, an aesthetic drive. But if you know that a free society is possible, it gives you wah, a, lot of, a lot of energy. So we have to produce more stuff like, Dick, like, like this uh, from Econ Stories, you know, the, the rap between between Hayek and, and I think it's it's wonderful. Uh, we ha we need more artists because even the artists are um, encapsulated into the system because they get subsidies for for their art. This is what George Orwell described in 1984. The system organizes it, its own opposition. This is called controlled opposition. So we have a sub debate between two artists, and then people think, "Wow, we have a we have a vibrant." debating community, but the premise is false. So we, we have to have uh, artists who do not get subsidies, who are independent from the government, but that would require that we have uh, entrepreneurs as well, willing to invest in culture, willing to invest in artists who proclaim a free society. And then um, a final word. Um, I have said that ideology is a narrative to legitimize power, but if you take it to the psychological level and you start 
thinking why people want power, then you see that ideology is also a way to reduce anxiety. It's a coping mechanism. The world is not as I want it to be, and therefore a projection of my inner world has to be put on the outer world, and I bridge the gap by forcing other people. I see a lot of libertarians who are liberty, 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 but they are real assholes. <laughs> I don't want to do, have to do anything with them. And if you take this, culture is a, is a function of what we think. So if you take this to the personal level, I will do it with you very fastly. We can talk about this later. later. What happens when you are born? The first thing you do is grab stuff around you. You could say that that is the economic phase. And you want food, you want something to play with. And then you see that the other kid wants this little bicycle as well. So you have a conflict. And apparently there are grown-up people who have devised rules. Now Johnny, this first half hour, he will play with the bike. And after that, he will give the property to you. Then you can play with it without hindrance. You, have to, you have, don't have to defend the bicycle. This is the rule. So that's the level of sociology. And kids are great lawgivers. If you if you trespass on a, on a rule, they'll, they'll be the first to say, well, this is not just because the rule says this and that and that. Until they see that some people get away with breaking the rules anyhow. And that's when they start asking themselves, well, what actually legitimizes this whole system? That's the ethical phase. And then you start, uh, they start thinking, and if we all would do this or we all would do that, they're very collectivist in, in, in this first instance. This is what I call the collectivism of the objectivists. I'm very sorry. Uh, this is the prefab moral code that everybody has to fo follow. And if you don't follow it, you're immoral, period. We, we don't discuss with you anymore. Then after a while, you'll see that simply nobody follows your, your lead. So the only thing you can say, well, is I will construct my own moral code using the same radix, using the same uh, starting point. And if you get to the highest abstractions of metaphysics, then you can get a religious feeling about, you know, let's just all get together. Uh, and, uh, you know, all these kinds of ideologies, they are just separating us. And it sounds a little bit hippie, uh, but that is not what I mean. You can be a very enlightened person and still fight for freedom. But um, you really have to try to apply um, lowering your time preference and heightening your abstraction. Uh, in your personal life, I think that will be uh, helpful to the libertarian community. And well, this is it. I hope I have given you some uh, some inspiration. I want to I want to stop with a with a with a with a quote by Orwell: "He who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past." And if we um, and if you know that history is just an illustration of the, the theory we want to see it, it's very important that we um, um, are vigilant about uh, wrong concepts, about concepts that have been borrowed and not been bought, not been produced by the distortion of uh, the structure of production. Thank you. I was just wondering, you mentioned the idea of an intellectual uh, rate of return on concepts. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, could you explain that a little more? Would you be able to give an example of uh, time periods when the rate of return on concepts was higher and when it was lower, and what factors influenced that change? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, well, if I if I want to answer it, I would have to go into some historical analysis, um, and maybe I can start with with a quote. Um, I say that modernity is perversity. Uh, why? I, I can show you why. If you have if you have intellectuals injecting fiat meanings into existing concepts, then you will have a vacuum at the top. Uh, for instance, um, if you take Descartes, for instance, what he said was "Je pense donc je suis." So he he actually said that epistemology comes before metaphysics. So that that you have. Uh, that you have what you think, that is reality. And reality is made by what you think. That's, that is what Ayn Rand opposed against. If you have this injection of fiat uh, meanings, because if you have to think everything out, you're not just conceptualizing reality, you're inventing it, you're adding meanings to it constantly. And this means that in, in, in that time, 
that the intellectual interest rate uh, has been artificially lowered, artificially lowered, because there, it's, it's, if, if you have to buy a concept, you need to spend focus time. Um, if the interest uh, rate is high, it will be more profitable to think for yourself because if you have, if you have to borrow a concept, then you know you, you're going to pay allegiance to an intellectual, you know, but you, you could do it yourself. If the time pref if the intellectual interest rate is lowered, then why the hell would you think out everything for yourself? You can just follow uh, the, the the go with the flow, as they say. So. Um, to answer this question, when was it higher and when was it lower? Let me start by the beginning. You have two people. Maybe it's simplistic. Just don't don't quote me on what I'm going to say now. It's it's a, it's, it's a hypothesis. You could say that um, the Greek Greek culture was a culture of low time preference, so a culture that was inspired by high abstractions. Um, um, what you get is the, the, the main capital good, logic, has been developed by Aristotle, as we all know. But then you get a descent into uh, the Roman era, where you have a lot of um, uh, rhetorics. You have Cicero, you have... Uh, uh, but th th there's not that much philosophy. They just use the heritage of the Greeks. Um, of course, you have the meditations by Marcus Aurelius, and you have some philosophers, but the big philosophy is not done in the Roman era. Era. So what you get is they don't maintain their capital good. So the, the intellectual interest rate in uh, the Roman era is actually uh, dropping. Uh, people uh, start thinking less for themselves. And, if, uh, and by the end of this era, you go to the deep Middle Ages. Like in, in 50 or 60 years, you come from a Roman Empire who is shining uh, brightly, or so it seems. Because, for instance, a law is a science. Uh, during the Roman era, uh, era law expanded enormously. Uh, we still have Roman law. We don't. Uh, um, but in, in the Middle Ages, um, you, you you get a bust. Then then Plato comes. The Dark Ages in English. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the Dark Ages, yes. Because the Middle Ages, as we all know, the great uh, Aquinas re-injected Aristotelianism in, in Europe. That was the start of the Renaissance. Actually, it's not really an answer to your question, but if, if you use this scheme, you can explain why, why there are two Renaissances. You have the small Renaissance of the 13th century, and then you have the Renaissance of the Palazzi and all the big cultural events in, it, in Italy. Nowadays, they, they look upon it as two different Renaissances. I look upon it as, first, a philosophical Renaissance. That is what we need today, a second philosophical Renaissance. Uh, injecting Aristotle again, and it takes about three generations for new ideas to be accepted. You know, the first uh, generation thinks about them, the second generation um, does not want to accept it, but has to because it's it's more true, more more accurate than the other, and then they, they teach their children. So if you take three, 30 to 3 years to be the lifespan of a generation, you could say that you need a century uh, for each layer. So if I take a century down what you see is that in the 14th century, science, it explodes. We, we get the, the uh, in, in, in mathematics, in, in uh, astrology, in, in all kinds of things. Um, and when, um, so we, we have the middle, uh, the dark ages, you have the middle ages, we, we, we go back up again. Um, and then we go to um, the, you could say the, 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 the new boom, um, well, it would take us very far, but um, it's my um, uh, conviction that the, the religious wars of the 15th and, and, and 16th century are a new bust, a new intellectual bust. And then you go down to the Enlightenment, <laughs> because most people think that the Enlightenment is, 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 a, is, a, is a great thing. I don't. I think it's the right answer to the wrong question. But as you, as you see, to, to, to use this theory to really interpret history, you would need you know, five years of, 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 of more research to do it. But I, I would say that in, in, our, in our day, that the intellectual interest rate is very, very, very low. This is interesting. Uh, question. Yeah, yeah, why not? Um, essentially, you're saying that we're at a low period for uh, philosophers right now, is that right? Yes. But, all right. 
We're at a low period for the philosophers, but it seems that we're at a high period for the scientists. I don't know. Where I come from in Flanders, there have been, uh, in the last 10 years, have been produced 600 PhDs. It's such a small country. We have 6 million people, we have 600 PhDs. And a specialist who came on television like 30 years ago really was somebody. Uh, when I went to school, a, a person having a master's in history, that was really somebody. If you don't have a, two masters with international experience uh, in another language, you're nobody. You even have an inflation in, in diplomas. So even science is... Uh, so, so do you think we're... Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, just with science, do you think we're, we're living off a reserve fund or something like that? Because uh, there are like a, a lot of, you know, computers and in, in, in information technology, there's a lot of inventions. So just, I was just wondering... Well, um, you have a lengthening of the structure of production in intellectual terms as well. If, if you see how um, by... Actually, Rothbard has written about this, and it is, it's Peter Klein who has put it on his blog that he says... Uh, when government starts funding uh, scientific research, then research always <laughs> takes longer, and you know all kinds of theories are produced, but do they really identify reality? No. So you get an overinvestment, uh, malinvestment in, uh, in, uh, in 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 academic work, and then when the bust comes, the government needs to cut down on its expenses, and a lot of fruitful intellectual projects as, that have been undertaken uh, have to stop. So you have a lot of parallels between the two. I don't know if that is an answer to your question. Uh, question uh, Can you relate this? Uh, uh, would you say that the, the gold standard are the axioms. And can you say that the bankers are the intellectuals? Oh, in terms of uh, people in society. Well, individuals is just, you know, everybody that has to take a decision. Authorities is not only politicians. You know. um, it's anybody who has specific knowledge about a subject, and also who has shown consistency in the application of his principles. This can be writers. This can be journalists. This can be activists. Uh, everybody who is trying to change society in a political way, you could say that that is authorities. Mm, but bankers. This is an interesting thing. If you see that the majority, the vast majority of economists is trained by programs which are subsidized by central banks, <laughs> then you start seeing, you know, uh, how even economic theory is influenced by, you know, by very high level uh, cultural philosophy. For instance, if, if you uh, take the London School of Economics, which was founded by the Fabian Society, and you make it a prestigious uh, institute, then you, you can recuperate a lot of bright minds. There are a lot of bright minds at London School of Economics. I won't me, me, you won't say, hear me saying that. But are they conscious of um, what freedom is? Are they conscious that they are being used to legitimize the system of uh, fiat money interaction with their banking? I don't know. I don't think so. They, they never even saw the alternative. So to, to, to pinpoint each and every profession in this uh, in this uh, structure, you could have never done it. Maybe we could do the exercise. And what about the other thing? I mean, I was thinking about uh, the to to fight inflation, you need a standard. And what is the standard? Mm. It has to be the axioms. I think, reality. <laughs> I think um, just applying logic to, to to observations. Because if you discuss with people from the left, uh, actually, I had a discussion two weeks ago on my Facebook. And it came down, because if you have a discussion, it always starts with, uh, what should the government do? And then you say, well, is it ethical for the government to do this? This is level three. And well, what is your basis of ethics? This is level four. The, the, my ident identification of reality, that is, that is level four. And then you, then you go even further. Uh, and he actually said, well, logic. You know, logic is such a vulgar thing. He really actually said that. So where are you then? What, what can you say more if logic is a vulgar thing? So I would say the gold standard for debating is using logic and defending axioms. More, I cannot say more. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. How do you define reality? 
<laughs> it has no definition. No, the, the, the goal of definitions is to link conceptual levels. And the definition of a, of a chair is a piece of furniture, genus, which you can sit on, uh, differentia. But if you have to connect the highest abstraction to reality, the highest abstraction is reality. The essence of essence is being, as, as Thomas of Aquinas said. So if you t try to define existence, you cannot. Because it's the highest, the highest level. Try to, try to define the lowest observation, you cannot. Because it's not relating to something lower than that. And there's, there's a lot behind this. We, we can, you know, catch, have some beers and discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If, if there are no more questions, uh, maybe we should head out. <laughs> to the bar. Thank you for your talk. I, I, uh, I will you, uh, ask you a question about uh, what is a uh, true intellectual. Because you said before that in the Roman era, uh, the aristocrats, the intellectual aristocrats, uh, like uh, as Cicerón, Cicero, Caesar, uh, Aristoteles, uh, they don't, uh, they they didn't try to get money mm -hmm. uh, for your souls, mm -hmm. and uh, later uh, nowadays the problems are, I think that uh, ha how to be an independent intellectual mm -hmm. because uh, if you get, if you try to get money, the That's government, uh, if you try to to get money and to to be public your boots, for instance. Yes. I, I can see this in in House of Boots. Mm -hmm. it, it, it nowadays uh, James Joyce or Juan Rulfo try to to publish their boots. It's impossible because impossible. the people is yeah. the intellectual industry is very low. Yeah. I think. How do you think about that? Well, um, well, again, you have to check your premises. If if you think that we will change society by taking over the system, by acquiring uh, subsidies or money from the system to inject libertarianism into the system, y you will fail because your premise is faulty. You're doing it with stolen money, so you're, it cannot work. What we really need is for entrepreneurs to lower their time preference beyond death. That's what I mean. Um, let me just elaborate on this. If you see the marginal utility of money, if you make a thousand euros a month and you make an, another thousand, then you have a hundred percent more. If you make ten thousand a month and you make thousand, you have only ten percent more. And at a certain given uh, point, your marginal utility of money drops. I know this is subjective, and I know this argument has been used for progressive taxes, but it does. It's not because they misuse an argument that we cannot use the, the, the reality of, of the thing. It is like that. This is the phase between 30 and 40. Um, after that, an entrepreneur uh, says, like, I make all the money I want. What I'm going to do now is to do what I really want to do, because often they have inherited a, a, a company. This is the second phase of uh, personal development. They, they, for, they start a... a um, a bicycle factory or something, and everybody said, well, what are you doing in a bicycle factory? You, you had a, a great insurance company. No, this is what I want to do. But then even the marginal util utility of personal development drops, and then you come into what I call the Donald Draper phase. Uh, Donald Draper is the guy from Mad Men, uh, the, the, an advertising bureau in, in New York, and this guy has everything. He has uh, all the money in the world he wants. He's very creative but still he feels this enormous emptiness. And this is the third phase, which I call the metaphysical phase, in which um, entrepreneurs who have achieved everything, have, have constructed every company they want, they want to, you know, um, they start realizing that the talents they had, that the, 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 the health they had, the energy they had, uh, is not their own, um, not of their own making. It's something they have been given at birth, they have been, not been more lucky, but they had more talents. And then they, they start to feel gratitude at the same time. And in Flanders, I'm talking with uh, a whole lot of entrepreneurs who are in this phase, and they're like 50, 60, 65, who are ready uh, to, um, to give. And this is actually what uh, Messinas did. 
the Messinas was a very rich man, and but he, he could not find gratification anymore, nor in money, nor in self-development. And then he started sponsoring artists, and the most beautiful art has been created in that time, because it's not art that has to aid the slaves to to conform. They're they're not creating idols. They're creating uh, new things to to liberate people. And so, if you can make a connection between entrepreneurs in that phase and artists who have really a, a, a message to tell, well, this is this is the best ally you can get to free your society because most people do not change their behavior by rational deliberation. No, no, they change their behavior by imitation. And if they see uh, an artist who has some degree of confidence telling that the free society is the best society, then they will follow just because, you know, this guy has some authority. So even in publishing books, why can't we put money together, like 100 million euros, that there is enough money in Europe within in, in, the, in the community of entrepreneurs to put up a, a new um, uh, publisher fund? I, I don't see. Why are we always trying to be accepted by the system? The only way you can be accepted by the system is to lose all your individuality. That's my, my view on things. Eva, what you're doing is interesting, but I see some problems and I have a couple of suggestions. Good. You might want to study memetics if you have not done it yet. Instead of thinking about people exchanging ideas or what you call concepts, think about ideas themselves mm -hmm. as entities that reproduce from carrier to carrier, from head of a person to the mind of another person or maybe an external storage mm -hmm. because in memetics some of these things have already been studied uh -huh. also then there is the economics of knowledge or the economics of ideas and the sociology of ideas but some of the expressions you use about buying concepts buying ideas you may say you buy an idea I understand what you mean that you buy when you assimilate it but mm -hmm. If there is no payment, I mean, you have an expense, the attention. You, you speak about focus attention. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay to the other person, there hasn't been a real buying. It has you pay recognition. Like, that would be that would be a, 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 a good idea. Actually, in memetics, sometimes you speak some ideas. You have to pay for them in order to receive them. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when a teacher teaches you something, an instructor. But other ideas, it is the other way around. The other person has to pay you in order to have you accept them. Like, for instance, religious ideas. That's why religious orders give education free, because they offer you the education and they That's it. Yes. They, tr they pass their, their, memes, their memes to you. I think that you give too much importance to philosophers and to axioms and high-level ideas. The high-level ideas are not advancing much. I mean, most of them have already been thought about or discovered, and philosophers now are, are not doing revolutionary things that were not done 20 years ago, or 100 years ago. Scientists are much more important because science really is progressive. Science really advances. Mm -hmm. these, these distinctions are maybe too clean for my taste in the mm -hmm. sense that People operate in all the in all the course, levels. Course. I mean, these are matryoshka dolls. Yeah. So. And so, so, well, to think this out, I had to get to the level of, of philosophy, because if I would just be an individual, the only thing I would do is, is value ends and be concerned with economics. But I, I you know, coming to Madrid, I was concerned with the political system, which can enforce enforce property rights, with the ethics that is behind that, with the epistemological assumptions you need to construct an ethics. And with, you know, the, the question before knowledge is, what is there to have knowledge about in the first place? So I think maybe you could use other, I could, I could say, say here, these are teachers, for instance. I could use other uh, instead of authorities. But, well, no, but you, you may want to distinguish whether you consider authorities like kind of intellectual authorities, people who yes. have prestige, yes. then, then you need to include them there political authorities. When you say that individuals act and value ends, yes, but they act mm. in a political environment, which means which means that other people make decisions for them. So yes. you need to include the political authorities. Yes. That's the, that's the inflated because kind. Actually, what I suggest is that you, 
include an analysis of of power mm -hmm. and about how ideas are used in order to manipulate people. Yes. Ideas are not just knowledge that you transmit others so that they learn. Mm -hmm. You just not, don't share knowledge to make others happy and make That's them true. more intelligent. Yeah. Many ideas, people speak to produce a good image of themselves, public relations, so they speak of justice and solidarity because it sounds good. <laughs> and if you speak about freedom, it sounds selfish. And, and then they want to inculcate ideas in other people so that they are able to manipulate them. Yes. This has been That's studied good. about yeah. in, in memetics and in, in the sociology of, uh, of, 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 uh, of knowledge. Also, you may want to study more about the theory, the theory of language. And you, you, you say that concepts are meaning, have meanings. Words have meanings, and I'm going to deny this right now. Concepts have reference. You have a word, a label, yes. either written or spoken. You have the concept, which is the abstract idea, and you have the reference, which is the, yes. the reality. Then the next thing is that words do not have meanings. This is a typical That's true. mistake a word, a word of people is... who are very logic-oriented. Words are given meanings by speakers. And if you say that someone is cheating, someone is inflating or distorting a concept, he may look at you and say, no, I'm just using it Another different mm -hmm. from you. Why should it be me, the cheat, and not you? Yeah, good the, the, the evolution of language is like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot help it. I mean, we get angry with when socialists speak of liberty, when mm -hmm. we understand that what they mean is power or wealth, and they say, hey, no, we want to use the word liberty as absence of coercion. Then they're going to tell you, well, I want to use it in a different sense. So. Yes. We'll have to agree to disagree, or or they will say we are more because the word liberty is mo used more like 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 what they say. That's a very good remark. So no answer. so just <laughs> you know just just I so that no you answer. see that that idea is good. The yeah. the, the distortion of of I would say more than the, the the fight to give meanings to words and to try to distort or force concepts mm -hmm. or. And try to, to fool people, but don't give for granted that there is a kind of a linguistic reality and we are pure and the rest no, of the no, people no. Are, are like no. like cheating. Yeah, that's a very good remark. I will take that home. Um, yeah. Mm, I don't have so, <laughs> and, and the last one is, let's go to money. <laughs> I think you. I don't know whether you have made a mistake or was it a lapsus. But what do you think the word fiat means? Uh, to um, uh, agree upon the authority of somebody else that it is something is worth something. Fiat, like fiat money. Yes, I, I, uh, I, um, I, yeah, I, I agree with. Uh, oh. the fiat means let it be done. Fiat is Latin. It says mm -hmm. when say. In, in, in religion, thy will be done, hágase mm -hmm. tu voluntad, is fiat volunta tua. It's fiat is have, have this done, have this made. Fiat means there is someone giving an order. It means do it. Mm -hmm. That's why f the, the concept of fiat money is coerced political money. Because you, when you were speaking, you, you, I think you must understood it with fiducia. Fiducia means trust. Fiduciary, Fiduciary media means Money based on trust, yes, but yes. trust trust can be a market phenomenon. It does it doesn't need a, a political a political. Mm -hmm. So so when you were yes, introducing yes. the idea of fiat concepts, mm -hmm. I mean, fiduciary concepts. Well, maybe that no. that, that maybe would mean yeah. that you are trusting the, uh, the the source of the idea, while, while while the fiat concept would be someone who is trying to impose maybe. an idea on yeah. you or to forge you so that you have. To use language in a in a certain way. I think those ideas are important. Just just to clarify, what you mean. So now let me be provocative and let's go to money. You think fractional reserve banking is immoral and you think it creates the, the business cycle? That's a whole different debate. I actually I'm working on a on a new essay, and it's called uh, the trouble with the tantum beam. Why fractional reserve banking is and can only be a pleonasm. So I'm in favor of fractional reserve banking. So you what? <laughs> you are going to favor? Yes. 
So you defend fractional reserve banking? Uh, well, yes, but I have to be very, very, very precise in my definition. And that's no. what the essay is about. But the thing that I, I, I wanted to use the, the last ideas you have given because they're useful for this debate. For those people who are against fractional reserve banking, check your premises. Your premises are wrong. Kill your dogmas because they are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the third one is the most important one. Recognize framing. Mm. All you have is a huge framing problem. You are framing banks as warehouses. You are framing banks as garage. You are framing banks as, as cloak storage places. They are not that. They have basically never been that. Rothbard and Jesús okay, Huerta de Soto have fooled you, and you cannot... Sorry, I'm very sorry. He always starts <laughs> about fractional reserve banking. Always. Sorry? You always start no, about No, no, I, I just wanted that. to I know. analyze this as an example well, of everything that you have said, which is interesting, how many people in the libertarian yeah. movement have got it wrong. Well, you should look at level four, then. What are the definitions you, you're going to use? That's the important thing. Because why is this debate so heated? And it's, it's a debate that has been going on for, what, 25, 30 years? And it's all, like, the word immoral is always around, you know? You're, you're in favor of fraction reserve banking, you're, so you're in favor for a fraud and stuff like that. So th that's level two. We are on the, on the ethical level condemning each other. But you should first check, you know, what's the definition of... When I, when I read uh, the, the, the article by, together, I think, Hoppe and, and, uh, and Hulsman in the Independent Review as an, as a, as an answer to White, uh, you know, I see that they do not understand each other's categories. And actually the only debate, the only debate that uh, economists of the Austrian school should have is about definitions. That's the real theoretical debate. All the applications and all the illustrations of what goes wrong with fractional reserve banking are no argument. An illustration can never be an argument. Only logic, eliminating contradiction, coming to uh, right definitions, that, that's the real debate to me. I agree with you that definitions are important. Then again, that's why fractional reserve banking, the critics are wrong. They are using weird definitions. Okay. They are using are anomalous. The rest of the world lives very happily and understand themselves when they start use, uh, using terms as money, mm -hmm. uh, bank deposits, or money, yeah. money substitute. It is them who are insisting on okay. using certain weird definitions. Okay. Also, if you see who is a good theorist, generally considered in money and banking uh, theory. They are white, they are Selgin, it is Fekete on the other side, and it is not Hoppe and it is not Hilsman, sorry. It's just it's for you to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Opinion or fact? Uh, more. Sí, si quieres. Pero voy a responder en inglés. Sure, sure. Con respecto a la creación de los conceptos, eh, la creación, como si dijésemos, objetivista del concepto, eh, lo que ha dicho Paco, realmente es, es un eslabón bastante posterior y solo para cuando quieres eh, hacer un, una teoría muy pura. Pero el uso normal de, de los conceptos se genera más como metáforas y como analogías. Normalmente casi todas las palabras que nosotros utilizamos son metáforas de otras. Eh, hay, hay un libro muy bueno de, de George Lakoff que se llama eh, Las metáforas de Metaphors Men Live By, que está bastante bien porque te das cuenta de que mucho del uso de la palabra es simplemente para meter una carga emocional de algo que te sugiere una cosa muy parecida. O sea, se genera en tu cabeza realidades análogas que tú las sientes parecidas, sí. no que... Entonces, y, y la cuestión de, la, de los conceptos, Paco lo, lo, ha, lo ha apuntado, o sea, los conceptos la gente los utiliza para comprender la realidad en algunas partes, para engañar en otras partes, y engañando, transformas la realidad porque haces que la otra persona, con lo que te está sirviendo, y otras simplemente porque tienen ese concepto, contenido también emocional, que no es tanto una cuestión de realidad como esa realidad con mi emoción junta. Mm. Entonces, 
desde ese punto de vista, la izquierda las utiliza sobre todo para emoción, emoción transmisión de emoción a otras personas y también para, digamos, manipular. Mm. Y desde ese punto de vista, como si dijésemos, quiero decir que hay como tres usos de los conceptos y, y, y por eso nunca vamos a coger, o sea, o, 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 o utilizas los conceptos en las tres formas mm. y, y, y es una cuestión si quieres o no manipular, al final la manipulación buena realmente es la, ¿no? la, que, la que tú dices la realidad, pero no toda la realidad. Esa es la que suelen utilizar oh, la gente más sofisticada, o sea, porque es una mentira, que no, de una realidad, pero la saco de concepto, la saco de contexto, por ejemplo, un Chomsky incluso te dice cosas, pero Chomsky tú... Chomsky es cultural marxist. Claro, pero, pero o sea, lo que él dice eh, no es lo que él dice, sino lo que él sugiere. No es lo que él dice, sino cómo te lleva a ti a, a pensar. Sí, sí, sí. Por ejemplo, yo solo veo con la, con, cuando dicen, la distribución de, lo, de, los, de los hogares más ricos y los, de, y los hogares más pobres se ha separado, se ha distinguido, se ha, o sea, se, se, ha, se ha ampliado. Entonces, tú pero puedes... Hay... No, no, pero es decir, tú puedes decir, joder, pues piensas y dices, claro, hace 20 años eran los mismos pobres que ahora y están todavía más empobrecidos. Y realmente, a lo mejor... Son otros pobres que en otro momento que ya están implicando que, que, que son las mismas... Es que pasa con los países. Es decir, la, la distinción entre los países más pobres y los países más ricos se ha ampliado. Sí, pero entre los países más pobres antes estaba Singapur, que ahora está entre los más ricos. Y entre los más ricos estaba antes Argentina, que está entre los más pobres. Entonces, no estás diciendo... De, de la otra forma, da una sensación de inmovilidad absoluta y de cada vez más distancia. ¿Y qué, qué, qué es su pregunta en, en este ámbito? Ah, perdón. <risa> <risa> bueno. Es como una segunda lectura, pero... No, no, no. Por el mismo precio. Simplemente eran las... las, las... No, pero... Eran, eran unas apostillas con, con respecto a lo de Paco y sobre todo cuando tú has comentado de que... Eh, la parte, como si dijésemos, emocional es la que utiliza más la izquierda. Dices, mm. ellos la utilizan, pero nosotros tenemos que ser como todavía más, in, más, más puristas. Digo, sí, pero entonces no vamos a llegar a las emociones. La pregunta que estás actually asking es, ¿cómo podemos declarar que nuestras definiciones son correctas? Es también tu pregunta. Así que, la otra parte, y la otra parte es, si insistimos en ser puro. Pure, then emotions can, can be... Well, but then we would have, a, have to have a discussion of, of, of the psychology of, of emotions. And, and let me start with, with, uh, with um, the question, how can we be sure and claim that our definitions are true? This is really the debate. This, this is the epistemological debate that we need. Definitions are not true. Well, okay. <laughs> Well, then we, then, we, no, then, we, then we can start with a discussion about the definition of the concept definition. No, really, this, these are meta, meta, meta discussions, but we have to do them. Not tonight. Logic, the only thing that can be true or false is propositions. Propositions are true. You relate different concepts. You relate different Yes. You can understand that the definition is a proposition, but the definition is an arbitrary relationship between a word mm. well, and no, a concept. Well, no, but uh, this, this will take us far too far. Um, so I, I, I acknowledge the problem that uh, it's very easy for us to say that our definition of liberty or our definition of justice is, is right. Uh, we have to be able to come up with a theory showing that we have a method. So that, so that we can actually really say that we are right, because it's but, easy. But, but you are insisting that we are right because there is a connotation in that word yes. that emotionally is, is attractive. That's why, why we are fighting about Is that emotions are not tools of knowledge. No, but, but, but you, you get uh, the <laughs> apoyo, you get Support, yeah, but this is this is the political discussion. This is level two. No, but that's that's why, true. What you say is true. That's why, why, why we're fighting about the word liberty. Of course, but this is this is the whole tactic of the Fabian society, injecting so many different meanings that we are actually are discussing about the definition of words, and in the meantime, our, our individual rights are being eroded. I acknowledge that, but if you want to combat that, if you want to go against that, 
you need a method to, to show that our definitions are right. That's the real debate. I haven't, I haven't been able to do it right now, but I would really love to do it. That debate. See, but I know, I know that they have an emo emotional charge. I know that. I know. I, I, I don't, I'm not denying this. I am not denying this, what you say right now, okay? So the only thing I'm saying is that if, it, if let's say we don't use logic and we don't insist on the right definitions, what would, would be the strategy then? That we just try to seduce the public with as nice emotions as we can, can fathom? Not, not, don't do that only. There is, okay, you have knowledge on one side, but if people do not care about your knowledge, because you, I, I may teach you here some mathematics. That's why I talk about personal. And I may tell you, I know. this is true. Paco, you don't I know. I don't Paco, care. that's why I talk about personal enlightenment, that it has to start with the individual. I see a lot of collectivism in the libertarian strategy. Yes, the libertarian strategy has to conquer individual per individual per individual. In order to do that, you must talk to them about things they care about. Yes, the, for instance, everybody cares about reducing their anxieties. I think that is a psychological need to feel uh, uh, at ease with, with, you know, with existence and have the feeling that you are uh, capable of realizing your dreams. All these kind of psychological needs. Well, if we start very cerebral, this is a just society, they will say, well, okay, well, do it, I'm not interested. If you can show that in that society, they will be uh, enabled to, to become who they are and not have, having to conform to whatever the socialists have planned. This is a personal touch. And I miss it. I miss it in, in, in the movement. I don't see it. I see it a, lot, a bit with uh, Molyneux try, tries to do that. Um, but there should be far more. Um, like, for instance, there's a website, very good website called Fear of Gentlemen, uh, where a libertarian is trying to apply the non-aggression principle on personal relationships between men and women. And I think that is very, like, all guys want to have a good girlfriend, and all girlfriends want to have a good guy. So if you can uh, apply the non-aggression principle in relationships, that is, a, you have a personal advantage of being a libertarian. So I think maybe we need more love in this. <laughs> and I'm really a hippie, you know? <laughs> I, I like this thing, last thing that you're saying, but do you see the contrast between, between all you have said before and, this? and what you have said now? No. Because before you were discussing at an intellectual level about how concepts are distorted, and all that, which is true, but yeah. they are going to say you. Again, I don't care if that concept is distorted. No, but if you can show, no. if you can show, if you can show that their cognitive dissonance, that the the fact that what they feel and what they think is different, if you can show that the cause is the the pressure to conform in the fiscal plantation, then they have an incentive to change that that political uh, structure. Maybe they don't. Because that is the. the maybe they don't feel, feel or think they are in a fiscal plantation. Maybe it, it, they think it's they don't need the, the weird guy, well, kind of lunatic, who is telling them things that they neither understand nor care about. Yeah. But then you can say maybe there's a teapot behind the moon. I, I kind of uh, solve all the problems here. The only thing I'm saying is that um, culture is a product of. Um, I define culture as the highest abstraction that inspire man and the material consequences of that. And if you have lower level concepts, just about consumerism, then your culture will be low. So it's all a function about how we think about reality. Are we able to lower our, our time preference? Like for instance, if I would have a very hard high time preference, I could not bring it up to, to work three years on, on a theory like this. But like nowadays in academia, it's publish or perish. You need to have five, six, seven articles a year. How, how much quality can come from an article like that? So, well, it's, it's a very broad debate. How, how can you motivate, even Voltaire said it, uh, how can you force people to be free? <laughs> you cannot force people to be free. If they don't want to be free, well, you know, just... And I do not believe in fighting the existing sociology. I believe in constructing a new sociology. And if we do not cooperate, cooperate with the system anymore, 
it will crumble out of its own weight. That that is what I think. You know, my, maybe I'm a bit romantic, but so okay. I think we. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.